Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. How's everyone doing? Good. How about you? I think I'm doing okay. I've been running around with my neck cut off. I apologize for the delay. I was having some issues connecting to my Zoom. Um, because um, I, I, uh, uh, I um, ultimately found out because my account is open on another computer that my fiance has who is traveling. So I had to try to get in contact with him. So I apologize about the delay. Sorry, guys. It worked out in my favor. I was racing my way back from work and I'm like, oh my God, class. And then I got the notification. So I'm like, okay, amazing. <laughs> right, and I was over here cooking, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad to know you guys are flexible. <laughs> All righty, good, good, good. So um, I wanna take a moment. Seems like we have about everybody I see on a, Ali, Andre, Alyssa, Harrison, Juliana, Julianne, Naomi, Orlando. Okay, she needs stuff. Okay, I think we're missing like two or three people, but I'm just gonna go ahead and um, get started. I want to start off with just recapping where we left off last week um, to make sure that we are all good on that information. Um, why am I not seeing it? Okay, I think this is what I want. Yes. Okay, so last week we talked about law and forensic science and um, we uh, talked about, um, we, re we read through the Dalbert v. Merrill Dow Supreme Court case opinion. We talked about the progression, right, of the legal standard for the admissibility of evidence. And we know that we started off with the Fry standard that, that, that stated general acceptance was the standard for admissibility. So if you wanted to put a scientist or an expert on stand to testify about the way in which they analyze the evidence, you had to prove, the attorneys had to prove that, um, um, that the science was generally accepted by those peers in the similar community or industry as the science, right? So as you can imagine, that was back, you know, that was back in 1923. So as you can imagine, I closed the door on a lot of these very um, innovative sciences and um, techniques that individuals were coming up with because it limited them be, uh, due to the fact that they may have not had what was general acceptance, right? And if you dig a little bit deeper, it also draws some ambiguity, right? Um, in the Fry case, there were no parameters, um, no guidance on what is general acceptance. What does that really mean? Like, do you, can you give me a certain number of experts in the industry that have to agree that this is an acceptable science? What are the parameters? What are, what, what are the guidelines for what one considered general acceptance? And so we can all just imagine how one court from the next court to the next court probably interpreted that very differently, um, which ended up being the case. And that's how we fast forward to Daubert, which is this huge landmark case that is used by many states today. And of course the federal government uses this standard since this is a federal case, um, where it opened the door on the admissibility of scientific um, evidence as well as scientific or expert witnesses, right? Um, and so when we walked through Daubert, we knew that we were dealing with a family whose um, children were born with birth defects, right? And I'm kind of just doing a recap to kind of refresh everyone's memory because I want to just make sure that you guys have a, a, at least a high level understanding of what we talked about. Um, we had a family with kids born with defects because mom 
ingested Benedictin, right? That was um, alleged to be the cause of the birth defects. Um, since the families were harmed by this, you know, they were looking for some remedy. So that's why they sued Merrill Dow um, for, for, for relief in their harm. And so uh, you had this family and Merrill Dow in court and, 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 and lower courts, right? Because they kept appealing. You, we talked about how they went to the district court, they went to the United States Courts of Appeal, then they appealed to the Supreme Court because the other courts were using what? Fry, right? And um, the Daubert's argument is that that is not the correct standard. Uh, we should be using the federal rules of evidence, right? Because um, the argument here, and this is key, right, is that it was this paragraph here where the Dauberts were trying to put forth eight experts who were, uh, who had impressive credentials. They had done testing, in vivo and in vitro um, testing that showed there actually was a connection between Benedictine and these malformations or these birth defects. Um, the, uh, um, the challenge that the Dauberts faced was that the lower courts were saying that that type of science, the in vitro in vivo testing was not generally accepted, right? And, and, and that's why I think it's good to put things in perspective, perspective by year. 1993, we were kind of the new stage, early stage of research in that form, especially for purposes of investigations, for purposes of forensic science. Of course, we were using in vitro, um, definitely in vitro, um, in vivo testing for research purposes, right? For medical and scientific research, but it was very new to apply this type of science to an investigation to a, for a legal purpose, which is what, you know, makes it a forensic science because we all know now and hopefully we'll continue to drill it into your heads that a forensic science is any science used for the purpose of law, okay? Um, and so what the Supreme Court said here is, you know, um, we don't agree. We believe that um, these uh, um, lower courts should be using. Alina, que casi tomo de café. Um, oops, make sure you're, you're muted if you're not speaking. Um, uh -huh. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Media Lila. Uh -uh. Let me see if I can meet that person. Hold on. Media Lila, me dicen. Mm, okay. Um, so the Supreme Court said we should not be using Fry as the prerequisite. We should be using the federal rules of evidence to determine if um, admissibility has been met, right? So what they did was, let me move this out the way. That's when we walked through the federal rules of evidence, right? All of which are noted and discussed in the Dauber case. But what I want you guys to know is these rules and how we have rule 401, which describes what is relevance. Rule 402 describes and tell us that something very basic, right? That should be easily understood that if it is relevant, it's admissible, unless you have some of these exceptions. But if it's not relevant, it's not going to be admissible. Right. Then we talked about the difference between a lay witness and an expert witness. And we know that a lay witness is a person who um, is speaking about their own perception, something they've seen, touched, heard. Um, and then in contrast, you have an expert witness who is a person who actually didn't observe anything, right? We're calling on them upon for the purposes of their professional experience, where they're analyzing some evidence. Um, and they're using that evidence, uh, excuse me, they're using that analysis, that technique 
that scientific method or whatever we're talking about for the purposes of this case. So um, we, we talked about how do we deem an expert qualified, right? And we know that there is no standard about how many degrees you need or how many publications you must have. It's pretty wide open, right? You can be deemed an expert just basic, based off your experience. You may not have uh, a degree or education. Maybe you've had on the job experience and training for the past few years. That is okay. Um, we talked about, um, then we talked about B, D, and C, which are all determined by the Daubert factors. Okay, the five Daubert factors, you know, testability, rate of error, peer review, uh, controls, and general acceptance, all determine if we're actually dealing with a reliable science. Okay, and this rests upon our gatekeeper, right, which is the trial judge. The trial judge is going to determine if our expert meets the qualifications and if this is a reliable science by looking at the Daubert factors, uh, which are not a cookie cutter, right? You can weigh them, it's up to the trial ju judge to weigh them differently and that is fine, but he, should, he or she should consider all five, right? Um, the testability portion, the rate of error, the general acceptance, totality, consider it all in totality, and make an opinion on if he or she believes this is a reliable science, and if he or she does, and our expert is deemed qualified, they should be able to testify. Quick question. Yeah. So for the expert, um, I understand that they have to, like, I guess, go by a trial judge to see um, if they're qualified or not. Um, my question is one, how do they, how do they find these people who deem themselves quote unquote experts? And also, um, what, what does like the judge do anything in specific to make sure like that person qualifies as an expert? Like, is it just a set of questions that they ask a test? Like, you know what I mean? It's, it is a set of questions. Um, it's a process we call voir dire. Um, where they place the expert on stand and each attorney gets an opportunity to ask questions. Obviously the attorney that um, uh, is bringing forth that expert is gonna ask questions that support the fact that this expert is, is qualified um, and has the experience to talk about the topic. And then opposing counsel, of course, is going to try to poke holes in that only if they deem it's appropriate. You may, I've, I've experienced circumstances where opposing counsel had no questions. They were completely okay with this, this expert. Um, it's, but it's up to opposing counsel. Um, and then um, usually at that point, it's to, to, up to the judge to determine or say yay or nay to qualifications. Um, and uh, you know, usually the judges are looking for, you know, someone who has some training, on-the-job training, um, or have um, some uh, level of knowledge in some, some education. Now, you don't necessarily need the education. It's great if you have it, um, but you do have some experts who are educated. They get hired for a job, which is what exactly happened for, with me. I got my master's. I got hired by NYPD, and my first time testifying was was I think four or five months into being, four or five months after going through an intensive training. Um, the training was maybe five months or something like that. And then I started to picking up cases and I, I, was, I was testifying, I was called to testify within three or four months. So in that experience, for me, the judge can use the fact that I went through this intensive training, um, plus my education to support that I was deemed for, to be qualified. Now, it depends for your first question. I think you were asked, uh, uh, how do they pick these experts, right? How do they select experts? Um, was that the question? Yeah, it was basically like, how do they find the people that like deem themselves quote unquote experts? But you kind of answered it saying that like the attorney would bring somebody they assume 
is an expert yes. and they go back and forth with it. Yes. So um, keeping in mind, guys, here that we, you know, we, we got to be conscious that this we have civil cases and we have criminal cases. Dahlberg is a civil case. So there's no prosecutors or defense attorneys. In criminal cases, you have a prosecutor, you have a defense attorney under that umbrella, um, it, or I shouldn't say under that umbrella, but part of that litig that like um, criminal justice system, right? You have the legal side, which are our attorneys, then you have the enforcement side, right? Which is, and I'm kind of just making this up as I go along, so, but you have the enforcement side, which is like our police officers and our detectives. And then you also have the scientists who are our forensic experts. And um, in that criminal justice system, um, you have your forensic experts who usually work for, I think we talked about it the first week of class, they, they work under the police department or they work under the medical examiner's office. And um, they're, although they work under these entities, they are considered neutral parties, right? They don't work for or argue in support of the position of police officers or law enforcement. Um, but in criminal cases, usually any of the evidence that is shipped to our crime lab, those experts are usually going to automatically be asked to testify, only if it's necessary, right? Sometimes you have plea bargains and things like that where you don't even need to go to trial. So although you analyzed the evidence eight months ago, there's a plea, a plea deal and you don't need to testify. But if we get to that point, the prosecutor usually is going to call all those relevant experts in the crime lab that examine evidence re related to that case. Then what you have is the defense attorneys, sometimes they're not satisfied with the way in which the evidence was analyzed in the crime lab, right? Um, and this is kind of like a tactic they take to try to draw mind, um, draw doubt in the minds of the juror. They may ask for the evidence to also be analyzed separately by an independent private company. So in that case, they'll just ask whoever analyzed the evidence at that private company to also come and um, testify in um, court. Um, and then in contrast with the civil cases, usually you're, you're only dealing with private um, experts. You're not dealing with someone like me who worked in the crime lab because I only would testify for government cases, cases related to the state government um, criminal trials. For, so for civil cases, the attorneys usually search for private experts. And when I say private, I'm just meaning non-governmental like me. Um, private individuals who have put themselves out there to be experts, right? Usually you have people who are, have their own YouTube pages, they have their own publications, they do their own speaking engagements, they headline conferences. They're usually known people in the community and it's really very easy for, for attorneys for us to pick them out and ask them, hey, I have this case, this is the situation, this is evidence, can you analyze the evidence? They'll charge you a fee, blah, 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 blah. And then they, they kind of testify that way. So that's kind of how that, how that works. I know that was a very long answer to your question, but I hope I, I hope I answered it. Okay. So, and then um, after we talked about the federal rules of evidence, we then, you guys also had your forensic science um, slides, law and forensic science slides, I should say. Um, where it reiterated a lot of what we already talked about, right? But then we did talk about um, some random things related to law about, you know, who has the burden of proof. And we talked about substantial step. We talked about corpus delecti. You guys don't need to know the defenses that are listed in those slides, um, just mostly um, who has the burden of proof as well as corpus delecti in a criminal att attempt, talking about the substantial step. Um, don't need to know the defenses. And I think the latter part of that packet is really all repetitive to everything that's already in this document of the Federal Rules of Evidence. 
or your textbook. Okay, so kind of a recap to last week. Anybody else have any questions about that? Okay, so um, as you know, next week you have your test number one. Um, for test number one, I'm going to post an announcement so you guys, um, well, after class, I'll post an announcement of what we talked about and what you guys have to do next week. Um, but next week is your test number two. You are, I am not going to see you, right? You have the day, the time to just complete this online exam. You have multiple days to complete it. Just make sure that you submit it by the deadline. Um, you can go in and save as many times as you want. As part of the test, there are three questions relative to this trial, okay, which I, I, I think I, I walked you guys through. Um, I explained to you what your test may look like. So for um, the first two tests, at least, you're going to get, you have to read about a case and you'll then answer some questions about the case. It's three long answered questions, okay? So I just wanna throw that out to you guys because I know that since the test is not open to you, uh, you guys don't can't even read the instructions. And part of the instructions is just that, you, that some of the answers relate to this case. Um, so give you guys a heads up if you wanna start reading it this weekend or you just wanna wait till you open the test so you can know what questions you have to answer. Um, totally fine with me, but I just want to draw your attention to, to it here under uh, week number four, test one. I'm assuming the test also has multiple choice. It's not only like written. Correct. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So test number one, and actually, is it under syllabus? It may actually be under syllabus. Yeah. So week four, week number four, test number one. Um, I just advise you check Canvas for the open and close date. I personally have too many classes to keep remembering which date is what. So I just rely on you guys that you will just check Canvas for the dates of all your assignments. And then I also list here what's covered. So it's gonna cover week one, week two, week three. So week one is the overview, week two was law and forensic science. And then this week we're talking about pathology and anthropology. I have a question in regards to that. Um, how do I explain this? I, I might maybe a stupid question, but is it going to be the test going to be for the multiple choice questions and the majority of the links you got you send me send all of us or is it going to be more so on the textbook? It's on everything, everything that's assigned to you as reading, as well as um, the the documents that are linked here or that are under files or under modules um, and whatever we talk about in class. But it's going to, I just, I suggest you guys just wait till you see it. Cause like I said, you have three whole days to complete it. Um, and these are the same questions um, students get if we were in person and they had a limited time to complete the answers. Um, I don't think that you're gonna find it too difficult. So, um, yes, there are a few questions that are related to a assigned reading. And then the other questions could be multiple choice. They can be short answers. They can be fill in the blank. And it's going to be related to your materials. You're going to have everything accessible to you to get the answers to the questions. So I suggest, um, you know, getting all your slides together, making them easy to access for you and having your textbook in front of you. Thank you so much. I hope that helped, sure. Alrighty. Um, and then as far as schedule, I have it updated here. So after test number one, I'm not going to see you guys for a couple of weeks. Everything is gonna be on demand for you. I'll be posting recorded classes um, that will cover the topics for that week. So there will be recorded videos talking about forensic serology and blood stain pattern analysis, week number five, and week number six is DNA. Excuse me. All of these will be posted um, and available to you 
after test number one. So you'll have the freedom to watch these videos whenever you want. Um, even if you don't want to watch them, that's fine. It's totally up to you. Um, but you may find it beneficial for you to watch them at least before you take the next test, which is going to be immediately after spring break. Okay. Um, and then we'll come back together week seven. We'll have a live class where we'll talk about the difference between forensic toxicology and drugs. So um, again, next week, I'm not going to see you guys. Week number four, you'll take your test number one. Um, and then week number five, you'll watch an on-demand video, which will be posted and viewable to you under modules after test number one. Um, and again, after test number two, I'll also upload the on-demand video for DNA. You are going to have virtual labs for each of these, all will be available to you after test number one, okay? So you have about two weeks to get the labs done. Um, and I will, what you'll see is you'll um, see that these will be hyperlinked, okay? The reason they're not hyperlinked yet is because they're not available to you under assignments yet, okay? So I'll do that after um, test number one. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. For the labs, how long do you want our, resp our responses to be? All the instructions, each lab is different. Okay, so I can't answer that question. Um, I would just say follow the instructions for the lab. Some of these labs, you're filling in a table, right, and writing your observation. So it's not like you need to give an answer that has a certain length to it. You just have to complete whatever you need to fill in on the work the worksheet. Some of the other labs actually work, walk you through. Um, I'm not sure if it applies with any of these, but maybe some after spring break. Um, they walk you through a fake crime scene, right? And you're asked to click on different parts of the crime scene where they give you more information about the piece of evidence that's that's you know that you see on the screen or sometimes. Um, they uh, interview an eyewitness and you kind of walk through this really cool virtual lab and at the end they'll ask you a couple of questions and maybe ask you who you think killed her and you write your answers in and in that case you'll have to um, um, uh, save or take a screenshot of your answers and submit that into Canvas. Um, so I, there's no cookie cutter straight answer I can give you about um, how long your answer should be. I would just say um, follow the instructions um, and it should be clear to you at the time that it becomes open for you. But if, it, if it's not, um, you know, like I mentioned before, with all these labs, you have multiple days to complete them, usually two weeks. So you can always just ask me if you have questions once you actually see it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So one last thing, it's not noted on here and I actually take a moment after class to, to, to update it so it's clear. Again, I'm not gonna see you week five and six, but I will have office hours between six and seven every Tuesday, okay? I just ask that you give me, a, a um, shoot me a quick email to let me know that you're gonna jump on the office hours and I'll just see you right here on Zoom for office hours. It's optional, only come if you feel like you have questions, you need some clarity or things like that. But office hours will be available for week number five and week number six. Any questions about that? Perfect. All righty. So let's jump right in. Um, we're going to start off with um, we're going to jump right into forensic pathology. On one 
second. So um, you can pull up those slides. All righty, here we go. All righty, so we're going to, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna share my screen. All righty, you guys see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so um, so for um, this topic, we're talking about death investigations. We're talking everything dealing with dead bodies and how our experts examine dead by bodies and what information they can get out of examining dead bodies. Um, now, this does come from... Oops, your textbook. Some of the information is significantly covered in um, your 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 textbook. Okay, um, so definitely look at um, chapter six in your your textbook. But I'm going to go over um, some of the information and probably provide a little bit more detail um, than what is in your textbook. But the textbook does a really good job at um, talking about what um, our forensic experts are looking for. Okay. And I'm actually going to um, oops, take myself off video for a second. I'm sorry, guys, I'm, I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. I feel like I'm gonna like fall over. So just so that, cause, cause you got, can you guys still see me while I'm sharing my slides? Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. I'm gonna take myself off for a little bit cause I am starving. I just wanna eat a little bit, but I'll be, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Um, so. So when we're talking about death investigations, let's get a couple of things clear so we're all on the same page, right? We're going to be, you'll hear me use the word forensic pathologist, medical examiner, coroner, interchangeably, right? Because they are all individuals that examine dead bod bodies to, de to determine the cause and manner of death. So. Just so we're all clear, those three terminologies, coroner, medical examiner, forensic pathologist, they're all the same thing. Um, they all acquire their, there are some differences, but we use the words interchangeably, okay? And we'll talk about what those differences are. So their primary role is to determine the cause and manner of death. And we're gonna talk about what cause and manner actually mean in the next slides. But that, that is their number one responsibility. No one else has this responsibility. It is not shared with anyone. Sometimes though, uh, our pathologists will work with other experts, our odontologists, We'll talk about odontology later in the semester. They work with the anthropologist, okay, which we'll talk about tonight. Sometimes they work with a forensic entomologist, okay, to help them estimate time of death um, because it helps the forensic pathologist answer some of these other basic questions here. Um, they must answer several other basic questions, right? Who was our victim? What are the injuries? When did the injury, injuries occur? 
and how were they inflicted? That all kind of falls under um, the autopsy that the forensic pathologist may or may not conduct. Um, it's no one else's responsibility to determine the answers to this, including who's our victim. You'll notice on crime scenes, particularly, no one touches the body until some representative of the medical examiner's office is there. You may not actually get the chief medical examiner on the crime scene, right? But you will get one of their other death investigators who will come on the scene. They have custody of the body. So they'll be the ones touching the body, examining the body, moving the bodies for the purpose of investigating that crime scene. And usually the first thing they're going to do is they want to look for identification, okay? Because that meets one of these several basic questions they need to have is identifying our victim. Um, Sometimes though, we deal and we present with bodies that are highly decomposed and um, very hard to recognize. So when we start to shift away from that, we are going to need, that's when the help of our anthropologist comes along because our anthropologist is the person who analyzes um, skeletal remains, right? And we're, so we're dealing with bodies that are really decomposed, shifting into skeleton skeletonization or mummification. Sometimes all we have is a skull, right? So that's when we're going to tap into our odontologist to review some dental records and try to identify whose um, dental structures on this skull do they match with, okay? But ultimately, in working with those um, those other experts, um, they will take that information and um, use that to come up with an answer of who is um, identify the body. Okay. But before we, I want to take a step back and this is, I failed to do this. I apologize. I was just so excited to eat, I guess, but let me go up here. One thing I do like to do between before we start any subspecialty is make sure you guys understand the science. Because again, a forensic science, right, is a science used for the application of law. If you see forensics in front of any other word, that is, um, uh, that, that means that it's being applied for an investigation or law when we see forensics. So when we see forensic pathology, for us to understand just the basic science, the basic understanding, of what this science is, it's really important for us to put our hands and cover the word forensic and just look at the, 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 the terms after that, okay? So does anybody actually know what pathology is? Okay, so pathology is the science of um, examining the body um, as, uh, it's impacted or affected by disease. So a pathologist is usually in the medical field. Okay. I don't think I've ever seen it not in the medical field. So it's usually a medical professional who has gone to school and has done research and residencies in the area of pathology. I don't wanna to dig too deep, but there are several different branches of pathology. Um, but at its foundation, pathology is the study of the bodily tissues and muscles um, when impacted by certain diseases, illnesses, bacteria, things like that. Because when our bodies are infiltrated with these, these different situations, our body, our organs start to make changes and they look drastically different. And um, a pathologist can examine these organs and get an idea of what has happened. Okay, so they're able to look at a person's lungs and see that they were suffering from pneumonia because they'll see mucus and air bubbles on the lungs. They're able to look at someone's liver um, or kidney, right? and get a sense of what was going on. Are we dealing with someone who was um, having liver failure? Are we dealing with someone who had um, cancer 
in, in, in the liver or whatever the case may be, you can see these changes when you examine the, the take out the, the organs during the autopsy. And then it'll actually start to slice through each organ to look at it under a microscope because you get to see even greater detail on a, a microscopic level at the cellular level of the changes that actually happen to our body when it's infiltrated with diseases and different illnesses and cancers and things like that. Okay, so that's what pathology means. So if you have anybody who's, who is um, trained and knowledge in that area, the moment that they're called to use their expertise for law or for investigation, they are a forensic pathologist, okay? Everybody understand that? Some other responsibilities, okay, yes, they'll perform autopsies um, or post-mortem examinations. Please understand though that they don't always do autopsies. They only do them if they're necessary. Um, sometimes an external examination is all they need to do, especially if we're dealing with a gunshot wound to the head or a strangulation or a hanging. Um, the cause of death is going to be evident to them, so there's no need to actually perform a full autopsy. What does a full autopsy mean? A full autopsy is when they do a Y-shaped incis incision into the chest. And they start pulling out the organ um, to examine them. A full autopsy is not always needed. Then they're also going to examine and document wounds. Okay. They're going to collect tissue speci specimens. Excuse me. And these tissue specimens um, are going to be used to look at under the microscope, as I mentioned, to get a cellular view of the changes happening within that particular organ. And then they'll also um, collect some samples for toxicology. And so for toxicology, um, we're gonna talk about that, I think right before spring break. Okay, so that's just the study of bodily fluids. And usually in those circumstances, the forensic pathologist is going to extract blood, urine, um, stomach contents, feces, to have a toxicologist examine it for the presence of drugs or poisons that may have contributed to the cause of death. Okay. It's not working. So cause of death, okay. Cause of death is the what, what actually caused the, um, the in injury or illness. Some examples, I've listed some examples here, heart disease, stroke, gunshot wound to the head, hanging, those are all the causes. You do have some situations, a proximal cause, which is kind of like a but for, quote unquote, but for analysis, but for you shooting me in the back and severing my spine, confining me to a wheelchair for X amount of years, I would have not died due to pneumonia six years later, right? Because there is evidence that, you know, um, people succumb to, to um, certain types of conditions start to, to suffer from compromised immune systems, right? So, but for the shooting, my immune system would have never been compromised and I later on would have not died, but for your actions. So there's sometimes arguments for proximal cause, um, but um, there's a lot of legal 
things we got to look into. Statutes of limitation is, is one of them. Okay. Manner of death, these should be straightforward. So you guys want to definitely try to memorize these. Homicide, suicide, accidental, natural, undetermined. Um, usually um, undetermined comes into play where there's not enough sufficient evidence to um, conclusively confirm the other four. Meaning that there's more evidence that we need to gather. Um, usually in this case, we have the pathologist and his or her team have exhausted all information that they know of to conclude um, one of the other four manners of death. So we need to go out there and gather some more information. Mechanism of death is the how, okay? These are more of like the physiological changes in the body. Okay. So when we're talking about for example, cerebral, cerebral anoxia, okay? That's lack of oxygen to the brain. That's how we get to the cause of death, like a hanging. The hanging can be the cause, but the physiological changes in the body um, is cerebral anoxia. Same thing with maybe a heart attack, okay? cardiac arrest can be the mechanism that caused it. So the mechanism, again, is kind of like what has actually happened in the body. These slides about the history of medicine, you guys can read them on your own. You're not going to be tested on these slides about the history of forensic medicine. It's just for your information. I at least want you guys to be aware that these slides kind of introduce you to how we got into this area of pathology. You know, how was it created and how did it come about? So you can read these slides at your leisure. Um, going, moving on to coroners and forensic pathologists and MEs, which is medical examiners. Okay. I want you guys to understand the difference between these individuals. A medical examiner or a forensic pathologist, okay, um, has a medical degree, they have an MD and they are licensed pathologists, meaning that they have done the residencies necessary to be deemed a pathologist, okay. In contrast, you do have coroners, which are um, elected officials. And um, these people can have a variety of backgrounds. Um, and I've listed some of them in the parenthetical there. So you can have nurses, you can have firefighters, you can have funeral directors um, who are considered um, coroners. Okay. So that's just a technicality between the difference between coroners and medical examiners. Now, there are some states in the country, very few. I think there's maybe, um, maybe two or three states that do have coroners. However, what you'll find is most all other states do have medical examiners who are dealing with licensed medical professionals. And even in those states where they do have a coroner, okay, maybe it's on a county level, um, there is a state medical examiner, right? You do have someone on the state level, or sometimes you actually do have medical examiner also on the county level. But I just don't want you to be um, um, under the perception that you know, we have these elected officials who are who may not have the ability to work with or be overseen by a medical professional. Um, and if you look it up, you'll see that, you know, previously cor coroners 
Um, it didn't really take much <laughs> to be a coroner. I think you just needed a license, a, a voter's registration card, and you could, you know, campaign to be elected for a, a coroner. But um, as I mentioned, in most cases now, we do have medical professionals. So these are the years of schooling it takes to become a pathologist. Um, and that uh, second to last, the penultimate um, bullet there, um, we'll have, uh, you'll we'll usually see them have one or two years of forensic pathology fellowship, which is um, specific in working with um, dead bodies, working with, well, I shouldn't say that because they're always kind of working with dead bodies, but working with dead bodies for the point, for the purpose of investigating. Okay, so that's when they'll probably have a fellowship working at a medical examiner's office or a coroner's office and actually conducting autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death because the cause and the manner of death um, is specific to, to autopsies. You can have forensic pathologists um, located in hospitals. You have um, who um, conduct autopsies for those people who have died while they were in the hospital. You also have medical examiners who um, uh, work out, you know, the government established um, medical examiner's office. Medical examiner's offices can be on the municipal le level, right? Um, or the county level. So municipal will be like LAPD, NY, NY, um, um, NYC. You know, they have medical examiners on the municipal level. level. Um, and then you can also see things on the county level. And then you can also um, see uh, medical examiners on the state level. Okay. Um, and they'll get called in to do investigations for deaths that are just considered unknown, excuse me, um, unusual. And then that's when they kind of step in and start to do their assessment of uh, whether this is uh, a homicide that requires further investigation. So steps of a medical legal autopsy. Um, for one of your labs, you guys are, are, are going to watch an autopsy video. Um, and uh, you'll watch in that video that um, the uh, medical examiners are extremely detailed oriented, right? They're really able to gather a lot of details from conducting an autopsy. And um, it's a really fascinating area. They have the ability to, um, you know, cut the body open, pick up the organs, and just by holding the organs in their hand, they can get a sense of how much it weighs. Then they'll start looking at the organ and they can get a sense of what's has, what has happened to this person for them to, to, to be in the circumstance that they're in. Um, then you'll watch them start to cut through the organs and they're looking for post-mortem changes, um, but they're also looking for changes that cause the death. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting feel that they're able to do that by just you know cutting through different organs. Um, but when it comes to the different steps, okay, they want to, of course, gather some background information by talking to family of the deceased, um, getting some information from CSI or the, or the detectives on the crime scene. Um, if they can get medical information, medical documents, they're going to want to gather that information as well. Um, then when we start to move into the actual like, kind of like the hands-on autopsy, um, the first thing they're gonna do is they're going to examine the external clothing or whatever external clothing is present. If they're in, if the body presents in a body bag, the body bag being the bag that they place the body in at the crime scene, um, they're going to start their examination at that moment. So they're recording, you know, so it can be dictated. Um, uh, what the body bag looks like, what number um, or any unique identifier, unique identifiers are present in the body bag. They'll open the body bag and continue with their examination. If the body is in, you know, suitcases, or if the body is in a garbage bag, or if the body is naked inside the body bag, they'll continue with their examination of uh, doing an external examination of the clothing. 
Um, and, there, and then after that, they'll start to remove the clothing. Keep in mind, any of the clothing that's removed from the body is going to be put in a bag and sent upstairs or downstairs to the forensic scientists that are also in the lab that look over clothes, maybe for trace evidence or to extract some blood or whatever the case is. They have their own team of forensic experts at the medical examiner's office, just like the forensic experts at the crime scene office who examine everything else that's not on or near the body. Um, so with the, the external examination, they're looking for every type of scar, mole, um, or injury. Um, the, again, they're very detailed oriented. Um, in the next few slides, I'll show you guys an example of an autopsy report. Um, if necessary, if after examining their external body, um, they do not have enough information to conclude on the cause of death, that's when they'll do the Y-shaped incision and they'll open the body up to start looking at um, some of the uh, some of the organs necessary for their for their autopsy. And then while doing the autopsy, they'll extract again some bodily fluids for toxicology purposes. Um, um, they'll usually take photographs or x-rays before they actually start the autopsy if it's necessary. Okay. So you guys already have um, the video with the autopsy. So you guys, if you haven't already, go ahead and watch that. I think um, and complete the assignment before the due date. Um, and I'm going to try to post some more videos for you guys of different uh, autopsy videos. Um, but I wanted to show you, how do I do this? Just so you can get a sense of the different layers of the skin that are present during the examination. I wanna show you this video I found on TikTok, you can have a look at the different layers of skin. You that can see that I spend, and you see here, here when I make a cut that goes through the. Hold on one second. Oh, here it is. Okay, so epidermis. Can you see that white tissue underneath? That's the dermis. That's the thick part of the skin that holds the skin together. It's a bit more tricky to cut through. And then underneath that, underneath that white thing is the fat layer under your skin. Have a look at the different okay. layers of skin that we cut through in surgery. And you see here, when I make a cut, that goes through the epidermis. Can you see that white tissue underneath? That's the dermis. That's the thick part of the skin that holds the skin together. It's a bit more tricky to cut through. And then underneath that, underneath that white thing, is the fat layer under your skin. Okay, so just to kind of show you guys what um, the body looks like from at least, you know, understanding the different layers of skin, there is um, that video for you to show you how easily they're able to kind of cut through the skin. And usually at that point, that's when they'll just start to open the body and um, start to look at the different organs. So some of the misconceptions, okay, um, or mistakes that are made in pathology are around not ensuring that you're recognizing what is a post-mortem artifact, right? Because once you do the autopsy, um, and usually if a family comes to claim the body, something's gonna happen to the body at that point. Either a surgery or, a, uh, not a surgery, a funeral, or they're gonna be cremated. So you wanna make sure you gather all the right information the first time, because there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to go back and reanalyze things and look for injuries that were post-mortem versus anti-mortem. 
Um, of course, you want to collect all your samples, whether it's tissue or bodily fluids. Um, so you could have a complete assessment of all the information necessary to make and conclude on a cause of death. Um, of course, you don't want to embalm the body prior to autopsy. You want to ensure that you have a tight chain of custody, okay? Meaning that um, the passing of the baton, okay, in this case, the baton, like kind of like in a relay race, the baton here is the body. You want to make sure that it is always accounted for um, and that you that your team, has followed the proper procedures to preserve the body before autopsy, right? You don't want to keep the body outside in a hot van for 12 hours, right? Because that's going to change the circumstances of the body. So the moment that is collected from the crime scene from our medical examiner's office, we want to make sure that uh, we are properly documenting and reporting how we're handling the body and making sure that once we're done with it, we have handed the body off to whomever is the right party, right? Which usually is a funeral director. We can talk a lot about what death is. This slide is more for your information. It's not gonna be something you're tested on, um, but there can be a whole semester on what is death. Um, and what does that mean? And especially in the legal world, what is death, right? What do we, if we're dealing with someone who's brain dead, is that considered death in, a, in the legal world where we can bring a homicide charge? Or do we have to wait to a certain point of death to make those, those to, you know, to pursue those type of charges? However, we do have some standards in the medical field of, of what they consider to be death. And there's certain things that they're looking for, which they call indications of death. Okay, so you have, you guys can kind of take a look at this here. Um, you know, you're dealing with someone who's unconscious. They're not responding to reflexes or stimuli. Um, their muscles are very flaccid. One thing you wanna look for in their eyes is what we call takanari, okay? I'll show you guys some pictures later on of what takanari is. Um, you'll get them to lose the reflexes of, um, of, uh, of light. Um, you also have something that we call trucking, um, which is actually when you see the blood vessels in the, under the eyelids of the eyeballs. I'll show you guys some, some pictures of that as well. And then, you know, you were dealing with just a, a, um, a loss of heartbeat. So getting into the good stuff, estimating time of death. Okay, so that is one responsibility for the pathologist, right? We know they're determining cause of death. We know that they're determining manner of death, right? Um, they're gonna identify the body. They need to, to determine um, like look at the injuries, how the injuries got there, but they also have to find out estimation of time of death. They are the person who is going to make that determination. And it's, it's imperative for our investigation. I'm sure you guys all understand that from, you know, if you watch First 48 or if you watch any of those other kind of like criminal investigation shows, estimating time of death is what starts the clock. Okay, and, and, and it's what's going to lead investigators to go the path that they do. Um, so usually estimation of time of death is something that can be determined fairly or early on um, in investigation. And there are four ways in which we can determine the time of death. We can estimate time of death. Live remortis, rigor mortis, algal mortis, and decomposition. These are in your textbook. Okay, so I am going to try to um, go through them without getting too deep in the woods. Um, so we do have a, um, how do I exit out of this? Mm. Hold on.
Sorry, guys. My... Here we go. Okay, I'm sorry. I... It's really hard for me to read the messages while I'm presenting, and I don't like that at all. Um, Okay, so we do have a question about brain dead, brain death. Um, when a person is um, considered brain dead um, due to, you know, actions of someone else, um, can the person be charged with murder at that moment? Um, or when the family decides to pull the plug. And that's the whole, the has, that's kind of like the whole legal argument that has been challenged in many jurisdictions um, of what is brain death. Um, well, what you'll see often is if the person is brain dead, there is the opportunity for prosecutors to bring some type of charge to the perpetrator. Um, but it's usually not going to be at the highest, right? Because there's levels to this. It's not going to be the highest of homicide. It's probably going to be some type of assault, you know, some type of battery. Um, um, they can, you know, right? They can try to prove the person is criminally liable for putting the person in this circumstance. But the charges are probably not going to be at the level of a homicide um, because it's just, it's too much of a argumentative and just debatable area of law of what is brain dead. It's going to, you're gonna use a lot of court time with opposing counsel, with defense attorneys saying that you're bringing charges against this, my client and we don't have a dead body. Um, but usually what prosecutors will then do is once, the person dies, whether it is the family, you know, removing the person from life support, or if they actually just die um, in the hospital, despite medical efforts, usually at that point, that's when they'll, they'll um, charge them for the death of that person. I hope that answered your question. If not, just hit me up in the chat again. to like piggyback that i'm yeah. assuming it also has to do with, with like the brutality of what happened you know what i mean like i'm assuming obviously if it was an accident and it caused the person to like be brain dead due to the injury it wouldn't be as tough if that makes sense right so that's when <clears throat> we have to listen into um cause of death right because it causes because when you say accident only the only the medical examiner can determine if it's an accident. Okay. Right. I, but but what you can have is prosecutors are going to bring charges against that person for killing this person. The defense counsel must say no 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 it was an accident. You know there it, we didn't my client didn't act intentionally to harm this person. And you know what at that point it's up to the jury. The jury makes a determination, and that's why we have these cases where. We, we totally believe that someone is guilty, right? Based off the evidence we see on television and in the news, but the jury comes out with an acquittal. Um, those type of merits, that's left for the jury to determine. It's not something as attorneys, we, we can, can push that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, no, cause it's kind of tricky. Cause I remember when I took some classes, they'd mentioned how like medically, they would consider somebody dead if they are brain dead and like they would take the time the donor to like get rid of like you know the heart lung whatever it is that they can um do so i was assuming like if someone's brain dead and medically they consider them dead does that play an effect with legality it, it can it's 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 one of those very debatable um conversations and just um looking at it from the legal world um 
and, and it, it can be a semester, a year's worth of, of legal research and legal classing. It's, it's just, it's very debatable um, conversation, but because they're to you exactly to your, your point, there is um, a gap between medical um, and then legal. It's very controversial. Um, I, I'll make a note. Maybe I could try to post some some stuff for you guys related to that, so you can just look at it on your own. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, okay, so more questions um, that I see uh, coming up in the chat. Just give me one second. All right. Okay, so we have questions about isn't an accidental murder considered manslaughter? Is it just up to the jury? Great question. You guys really like these legal questions. <laughs> um, so under homicide, we have um kind of like two different categories, right? In the legal world. We have um, murder, okay? And murder is um, usually premeditated, it's purposeful. And then you have manslaughter, okay? Where you gotta take away that component of premeditation. Um, however, in both murder and manslaughter, which all fall under this umbrella of homicide, uh, you also have intentional and you have unintentional. So you can be guilty of murder, but your, in, your actions were unintentional. Um, and then same thing uh, with 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 manslaughter. Um, when we, I, I think for, for when you say accidental murder, um, I'm going to presume you mean like um, recklessness, right? Extreme recklessness. Um, um, but there is no such thing as an accidental murder because with murder, you're in, you are intentional with your actions, meaning that you were premeditated. And even if you were unintentional um, to kill, you were still intentional to cause harm. Does that make sense? So you can have someone who pulls the trigger and this is where it can get so dirty and so messy in, in the, um, in, in the trial. So as attorneys, we want to make sure we're giving the jury all the evidence they need to prove our point. And then ultimately, yes, we, we do leave it towards the, um, to, towards the jury. Um, but if the person acted unintentionally um, without premeditation, that can be manslaughter. If that hopefully that answers, the and that's question. usually like vehicular man manslaughter, right? Yes. So vehicular manslaughter, yes, you were just manslaughter is just basically acting negligent um, in a in a criminal way, um, where you just had no disregard, you know, for for human life, although you didn't act. So when we say premeditation, we're talking about premeditation thoughts to kill. 
when we're talking about murder or we're talking about homicide. But with manslaughter, you don't necessarily have that premeditation to kill, but you were acting negligently in a way that you just totally disregarded all other human life. So we still find you criminal, criminally liable. Hopefully that makes sense. Absolutely, it's all about the mens rea. You can, you can also have uh, felony murder. Felony murder um, can be, obviously it's a murder because we have the word murder in it, um, but it's um, unintentional killing right, where usually um, you, it's kind of like capital murder, okay, where you have, you're in the process of committing one crime, and in committing that crime, you kill someone. Um, so maybe, I don't know, you're robbing a, a convenience store, right, your intention was only to rob the convenience store, not to actually kill anybody, but in commission of that crime, you do end up killing someone, maybe you, you shoot the gun recklessly, um, we automatically bump that into to, to the category of murder. Any other questions about that before we move on? Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Oh my goodness, 735. All righty, let's take it back over here. Um, so we're talking about the three ways to estimate death, time of death. We have live mortis. Um, you know, we have live mortis, rigor mortis, algal mortis, decomposition, right? So live mortis is the color change, this kind of reddish blue discoloration that we see on the skin, right? And this becomes apparent on the dependent parts of the body, okay? So you're gonna look at the, the, the gravitational pull that is going to determine how we see a live mortis. Um, live mortis is, is, is the pooling, the pulling of the blood due to gravitational pull on towards the dependent parts of the body. So if we walked on our crime scene and we saw this, this body laying in the way that it is, we know that we're dealing with a situation where the body has been moved because we have all this lividity. I can't use my mouse, I'm sorry, but the reddish uh, kind of bluish color is lividity. And we know that at one point this body was lying on its back. And you can even see the elastic band has formed a mark. Her buttocks and the top of the shoulders are the dependent parts of the body. And we have the pooling of the, the, the blood um, everywhere else. Now, in the cases of live mortis, we're not dealing with situations. This does not mean the blood is outside the vessels. The blood still remains in the blood vessels. It's just that gravitational pull and the collection, the gathering of the blood stains due to the gravitational pull is what causes the discoloration on the skin. So you can see here, we have a little bit of live mortis on the back of the thighs and in the forearms, okay? Depending on um, the uptake of certain gases, we can actually see a change in the color of live mortis, okay? This is a very detailed oriented observation that we solely really rely on our pathologist to take over. But we're gonna talk about this a little bit later when we talk about asphyxial deaths. Um, we'll talk about some of these different colors of live mortis that we can see in those types of search situations. So with live mortis, we can see it as soon as 30 minutes. Professor? After. Yes. Sorry, I don't know if, you're, if you meant to share the screen, but we can't see what you're seeing. Oh my goodness, yes, I did. I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. I just I'll assume <laughs> you didn't know. Um, oh yeah, I see the messages. I'm sorry, guys. Some, I just don't, I don't know. When I'm sharing the screen, I don't see messages. So I'm so sorry. Okay, so you guys see my screen now? 
Okay. So with live remortis, we can normally see it within 30 minutes. Um, uh, but it varies, you know, on the temperature, it varies on the ambiance. It, it, it could really vary depending on the melanin in a person's skin, right? Lividity may not be as helpful, um, but it's still a tool for us to use, okay? And sometimes we can also see live remortis or what we also call lividity in the actual organs. And we'll notice that when we open the body up and do the autopsy. Um, Quick note here, you guys can star this, because although the other estimating times of death, like the live mortis, the rigor mortis, the algal mortis are already in your textbook, this slide is not in your textbook. And I want you to kind of be aware of how do we determine lividity versus contusion. I'm gonna post a video for this on this for you guys. As I mentioned with lividity, the blood is still in the vessels, it's intravascular. When we're dealing with contusions, you know, with bruises, um, where or some type of blunt force trauma, we're now dealing with broken blood vessels. That's the reason why we get the color um, due to bruises, right? Because we're dealing with damaged and broken blood vessels that have popped and the body is just trying to naturally heal them. So just like in that TikTok video I showed you guys, you saw that he was able to incise into the layers of the skin and we did not have blood everywhere. And that, that person, that was for like a, um, cosmetic surgery. So the person was alive, their heart was pumping. And you can see that when we incise into the skin, we don't have all this blood everywhere. <laughs> That's just not how it works. Your blood is always gonna be inside your vessels until they're broken. What lividity? There are no broken blood vessels. So the pathologist can do the same thing that that doctor did in the video that I showed you to determine if we're dealing with lividity or contusion because you could probably see that um, uh, the, the, the pictures I showed of lividity, it does kind of look like a large bruise, or in some cases, it can be a, a birthmark on some people, right? The way they tell a difference is they incise into the skin the same way that the, um, the, the doctor did in the video. And if they incise into the, into the skin and they don't see any broken blood vessels, like what we observed in that video, they know that it's lividity. However, if they do incise and there's blood, um, they, they know it's a contusion. Okay. Rigor mortis, also discussed in your textbook, is the stiffening of the muscles. Okay. That's when we get the bodies that present heart like a skeleton. Okay. Um, or um, a mannequin, I should say. Um, Rigor mortis is pretty reliable for us. I think um, there's a timetable that I have presented for you guys here that shows the progression of, um, of, of Rigor mortis, um, where we usually see the coldest and the stiffest presentation anywhere between eight to 36 hours after death. Now, we rely on our pathologist to tell us the exact time, right? They're going to know, especially if we're dealing with a pathologist that's located in Florida versus Maine or versus California. They're very in tune and educated to know based off research in just the environment, the weather conditions that they live in, that sometimes this can change and it can flux from, you know, one area versus another, you know, if we're dealing with um, you know, 60 degree weather versus 110 degrees or, or whatever. We kind of rely on them for that information because it can um, drastically change. These next two slides are um, not going to be tested on, okay? So you can start these and kind of make a note that these slides are not going to be tested on. It's just for your information, for those who want to understand the biology between um, of rigor mortis, where it's it's pretty much um, a buildup of ATP. So you know when we get the cramps in our legs, <clears throat> it's usually you know from a buildup. Excuse me, it's a buildup of lactic acid. 
So um, after death, there's a buildup of lactic acid and we don't have ATP, right? Which, which is kind of this protein that breaks down the lactic acid because the body is, is dead. So there's no ATP being produced to break that lactic acid. So over time after death, this lactic acid just continues to build. Um, and that's what makes the body very stiff. And then eventually it dissipates. And then that's when you kind of go back to this flaccid body. But when a body presents with its heightened rigor, um, it's, it's, they're, they're very, very, very hard. Um, I had the opportunity to sit in on a couple of um, autopsies. And in one case, the body was clearly had to be at what I would think, and I'm not a pathologist, at, at its probably its highest level of rigor mortis. Um, and it took several of us to kind of break that rigor. And, and essentially it's just a matter of, you know, half the team is holding down one part of the body and the other half of the team is kind of pulling the arm or the leg to stretch it out. Because once you break it, you can break the, the rigor, you can maneuver the body much more easily, which, which really makes for um, a more comfortable um, autopsy. Kinds of rigor mortis, this is not in your textbook, but I, you will need to know this. You have um, cadaveric spasm. And cadaveric spasm is a type of rigor that we see mostly in the forearms and the fingers, okay? Your forearms and the fingers of uh, the dead body, um, usually because of drownings, okay? It's an instantaneous rigor. An instantaneous rigor commonly seen um, in the forearms and the fingers of drowning deaths, right? Um, because it's natural under those circumstances for people to pull and try to grab things to lift them out of the water to breathe. And at the moment of death, usually whatever they were doing at the um, time of death is memorialized in their arms and fingers. So you'll, you'll typically see like something that looks like um, a person was grabbing for something. <clears throat> you can cross out freezing of tissues and rigor. Um, that's more of a conversational piece that um, we have to just make sure that it's really not a kind of rigor. That's why I, I just want you guys to kind of ignore that. It's just really about having the conversations to ensure that we're dealing with professionals who do know the difference between frozen and rigor, right? Frozen bodies and rigor, rigor mortis. And usually it proves difficult to determine um, when you're dealing with frozen bodies, um, if there is rigor. But you guys don't have to worry about that, so you can cross that out. Then we have pugilistic posture. Anybody have an idea of what they think pugilistic posture is? If you know the definition of pugilistic. So a pugilist, a pugilist is a boxer. So when you say pugilistic boxer, excuse me, pugilistic posture, you can also call that boxer stance or boxer posture. Um, and so this is a type of rigor, this, this boxer stance um, we, we, is mostly seen in fire depths and uh, the body presents as that of a boxer, like the way you would position your body like a boxer. So your knees are bent, your arms are up and flexed and, um, this is, this is a rigor that we typically see in fire deaths. Okay. Then algal mortis, this is in your textbook as well. Um, this is all about changes in body temperature. The last bullet point talks about the general rule. Um, it's about one hour after death, body will lose heat at a rate of approximately one to 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit per hour until the body reaches environmental temperature. 
So similarly to algor mortis, this can prove to be a challenge just based off different factors. You know, here, if you're in an environment that is above body temperature, right? So you're in a warmer, hotter environment than 98.3.7 degrees. Algal mortis is probably not going to be helpful to you because the body temperature is not going to decrease, it's actually going to increase. Um, and then you have the complete opposite that can happen. If you're in really cold environments, the body is probably going to decrease at a rate faster than one to 1 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit per, per hour, right? If we're dealing with situations where it's freezing or you know below freezing. However, depending on where, where, where we're located, it can actually prove to be helpful. Decomposition. So some of this stuff is not in your textbook. So just kind of, um, I went through the other three fairly quickly because it is in your textbook. And I don't think the information I presented is much different from your textbook. But when it comes to decomposition, you're gonna see a little bit more information in the slides. Um, so um, there's two different types of decomposition. We have autolytic or autolysis and putrefaction. Um, autolytic is happens naturally. It's happening naturally to all of us right now in our bodies, where our bodies naturally break down and decompose bad bacteria right, that we don't need. Um, it's, it's a self-dissolution. happens automatically and naturally in our bodies. Um, and then we have putrefaction. Okay, which is a type of decomposition that it is uh, uh, created through changes produced by the action of bacteria and other organisms. Okay, putrefaction is the decomposition related to dead bodies. Okay, you have autolysis. Okay, which is um, we actually have it on the next slide. Um, it, you do have um, some parts, some kinds of autolytic changes that do happen after death, but I just want you to know that um, there are also some autolytic changes that happen naturally to all of us, right? And these are a couple, you know, when we're dealing with um, uh, 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 like um, miscarriages, um, that is a type of autolytic change and then things that happen in our autodigestive system, okay? However, what you can see um, in decomposition um, with dead bodies, uh, that autolytic change, the gastrointestinal malacia, um, is not going to have any control because we're dealing with a dead body. So all of those bad intestines, excuse me, all those bad bacteria in our intestines, nothing is breaking it down. So after death, you're going to see that those bad bacteria and other bacteria in our intestines is just going to multiply, okay? And that contributes to this whole larger putrefactive process. So putrefaction can happen about three days post-mortem, okay? changes and varies, again, based on the environment that you're in. And we have, the last bullet talks about gases. There are a lot of different gases that contribute to the smell, horrible smell, horrible, horrible smell um, with dead bodies and the bloating, the swelling that we can see. Okay, and I've listed some of those putrefactive gases for you. For you, and um, I know just quick story here. When I uh, witnessed a couple of autopsies, um, um, yeah, one of the bodies was was kind of like early to mid stage decomposed, and um, it's just the smell is just indescribable, but it smells awful. Um, really, really, really bad. And so when I was in there um, observing the, the autopsy, the doctors used tea tree oil. They used tea tree oil and put it inside of their mask, which actually does help greatly, greatly with the smell of um, uh, the dead bodies. And then I, I know in one instance, 
while they were doing the autopsy. Um, uh, you know, the doctor's kind of just moving around and, and taking out different organs and he had to cut up a little bit of the intestines and he actually like punctured the intestines and then like all this feces came out and I just was about to lose my mind because it just smelled so bad, so bad. And they just, they just say, oh, use tea tree oil, tea tree oil. There was not enough tea tree oil in the world to help me knock that smell out. Um, and it's just kind of a smell that you just, you just can never forget. So you can't describe it, but you can never forget what it smells like. Awful. Um, so for the next few slides here, I kind of talk about the sequence of putrefaction. Just kind of start this and, and just take a note of it. Um, I'm not going to quiz you guys on the different stages of, 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 of putrefaction. Um, this is kind of more of an information, but I just want you to understand what putrefaction is on a high level. Now, if we get into the weeds, the next few slides kind of get into the weeds, just so you kind of understand for your information what's happening. Um, so we kind of, when we start off with our dead body, um, you know, you're going to go through these different stages of death, right? Usually within a minute after death, the body attracts insects, okay? You're gonna have ants and di different bugs crawling on the body within minutes. And then over a couple of days, you're going to have this, this, this buildup of gases, right? We no longer have that autolytic pr process going on. So the bacteria in our intestines, that's where it kind of all starts, is going to start to amplify and start to grow. Um, and so um, here, um, this is what that's kind of talking about, the, you know, um, the bacteria from our bowel and our abdomen is start to grow and it's going to progress throughout our abdomen. Um, you may start to see after a week, face and neck become a reddish swelling of somewhat, you're going to have this marbling effect, you know, which actually the skin looks like marble. And um, it's just a stage of the skin um, transforming into usually either mummification or skeletization. Okay. Usually all of this has to deal with your body is actually liquefied. Okay. So we're going to start to see some color changes in the abdomen. Again, the bacteria in your bowel is continue to going to continue to grow after a certain period of time. You're going to start to see skin blisters, which is usually it looks really just like the skin blisters we get. Um, but because your body is actually liquefying, you're going to get a buildup of, of liquid between the layers of the skin to the point where you can actually just take a Q-tip and, and sometimes just just pull the skin and, and you're gonna experience what we call skin slippage, which is a bullet point number one. Um, and because of this pressure, be sometimes because of the skin blister, certain parts of the skin in the body um, is going to just start to slide off. You're going to have an increased formation of these different gases over the next several weeks. Um, the body is going to start to, to darken, right? We're going to get away from, we're going to get start to get more to a black color. Um, then at one point, you're going to start to have infestation of insects. You can have maggots, rodents starting to feed on the body. Um, then you, um, you're going to get to a point where the body just really starts to liquefy. And when you guys watch this, um, autopsy video, if you haven't watched it, you can actually start to see that like the, the brain, I think they look at the brain, um, is kind of mushy, right? And that's not how fresh brain matter looks. It has a little bit of stiffness to it. Um, so just imagine what that brain would look like several weeks later, right? It's, it's really going to be very much liquefied at that point. Okay. And so all of this is just going to progress over a period of time to the point where there's no more tissue matter. There's no more, there aren't any muscles left that are going to liquefy. It's go, you're going to be left with skeletal remains, or you're going to be left with a mummified body. It depends on the environment. If you're indoors, if you're outdoors, if it's windy, if it's hot, if it's moist, if it's humidity, if the person is clothed, um, if they're covered, if they're buried, a lot of conditions will uh, trigger what type of body 
we're going to end up with. And when we get to this stage, and probably even a few steps prior to, because I'm sure identification is going to be different, excuse me, going to be difficult um, when you get to the later stages of putrefaction. They're a pathologist is probably going to need the help of a anthropologist or ontologist to come in and help with assessing the injuries on the body and definitely as, um, determining um, identity. Okay, um, the liquefying of the fat tissue. So in that TikTok video I showed you guys, you saw how he incised in the skin. He showed you the epidermis layer. He showed you the dermis layer. Then he showed you the adipose layer. Um, the adipose layer is just the layer of fat. Um, that kind of insulates all of us. And when we're dealing with death, um, we're going to experience adipose here, which is just a hydration or liquefying of that fat tissue. Okay. It starts to look a little bit like chicken fat. Um, and we're going to see adipose here in those areas in the States at the very last bullet, um, where we see a lot of fat tissue. Okay. So we're talking about our abdomen, our buttocks, our cheeks, and things like that. So taking a look at some pictures here, the image is not the clearest, but we can see that we have a little bit of adipose here on his cheeks, okay? Side of the face is probably a result of um, rodents and insects feeding on the body. Here, we're dealing with a um, couple of things, right? We, if you look on the, the side of the nostril, that's a skin blister, okay? Um, we can also see that the eyeballs and the cheeks are a little bit swollen. Um, however, you do see bubbles coming outside, coming from the mouth. So that's an indication that something alive is in the mouth. So there's probably some type of insects or bugs um, that have considered this mouth now they're home. And um, you even see um, some webbing on the side of the mouth, which is also an indication that some type of insect has been present. So from a pathologist perspective, we're going to rely on them to let us know if the state of this person's head, the way that we see it now, what parts of this is a result of the killing or is a result of some post-mortem change? due to putrefaction, due to, you know, insects and rodents feeding on the body. So this kind of, just trying to give you an example of, we rely on the pathologist to tell us this by doing an examination. Okay. Um, and I thought, I think the slides you guys have, these are not the right slides, are they? Um, because you guys should have Everything, you guys were sticking with me up until around this point, right? Because I think your slides should have slides about um, the pig, the different decompositions with the pig. Do, do your slides have that? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know what, um, why I don't have that here. I thought I did. Um, Oh, here it is. I'm showing you guys the wrong one. I'm sorry about that. Um, let me stop sharing that one and start sharing the right one. Give me two seconds to just fix this. Thank you for, for letting me know that. Sure. That's helpful to me. Okay. 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 So um, these next few slides, so I kind of went back a couple slides. Um, the, you guys can look at this for your information. Okay, you're not necessarily gonna be tested on it, but I wanted to give you a visual of what the stages of decomposition look like through, you, you know, by looking at um, pigs, fresh pigs. And um, he, for the next few slides, you can start to see the changes that can occur with this pig 
after a certain period of time. You know, we start to see a little bit of swelling. We do start to see um, some discoloration. Okay, um, we're starting to see what we see in humans, which is that skin slippage. Right, the body is essentially starting to liquefy, um, and we're going to see some infestation of insects feeding on the body. And as you just start to 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 go down um, the chronological timeline here. Um, you're going to see that we're, you know, we're just dealing with a situation where we're losing body tissue and body fat. That's all of what putrefaction is to the point where you're going to just get some, some um, skeletal remains. In this case, we're not going to get any type of mummification, but we should be left with skeletal remains here. Okay. So let's go back to mummification. You guys are with me, right? Yeah, quick question. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, when, uh, if they were to find the person, right, um, let's say at the dry decaying stage, will it still be like difficult to figure out like what caused their death? Like if it was natural, if it was, you know, like um, something that caused it, like a person, an accident? It can be. You said the the drying, like the d decaying. Yeah, like hypothetically speaking, they, they found the person at that stage of uh, decomposing. Yeah. Will it be hard to like figure out like cause of death, possibly the time of death, like stuff like that? It can be. It can be very difficult because um, all of the evidence, right? The um, details that a pathologist is looking for is in our tissue matter. It's in our muscles and our tissue. So when we get to a certain stage of like decay or putrefaction, yeah, it can prove very difficult for the pathologist to make a determination of what happened because they don't have anything to work with. Um, however, you know, like I said, they can start to talk to an anthropologist. Maybe there's injuries inflicted on this actual skeletal structure, maybe they can find evidence of a brain fracture or multiple broken bones, right? Or some type of sharp injury um, on the actual skeletal remains. Maybe they can get some information that way, but you're, yeah, it you can prove very difficult for the pathologist. So in that case, it is, it's really a matter of, um, uh, you know, the, the body is probably going to be considered a Jane Doe, right? If they can't identify it. If we're at that stage of putrefaction, identification is probably going to be difficult. So we're probably dealing with a Jane Doe or Jane or, um, 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 or John. And um, rely on our detectives and our investigators to, to get us some more information. Are there any eyewitnesses? Anybody with any information? Um, that saw something um, that can support that someone's responsible. Um, but it can definitely prove to be very difficult. Um, so you guys can take a look at this, this slide, which talks about mummification, okay? And what mummification looks like. And, um, the presence, as I mentioned, can vary. It really depends on the environment. Sometimes mummification can be accelerated, you know, um, seen a little bit faster in certain environments versus other environments. Here is just talking about some of the post-mortem damage um, by predators. Um, you know, we're dealing with rodents, cats, dogs, birds, fish, especially if we're dealing with bodies submerged in open bodies of water. And of course we have insects. Insects, like I said, are attracted to the body within a few minutes of death. Um, so they're one of the first predators. Um, and although they're not always preying on the animal, sometimes they're just kind of living in the body, but then sometimes they are feeding on, on the body. 
Um, so when we're dealing with insects, um, keep in mind we have a forensic entomology. Um, we don't have time to go over today. But you guys can watch the video or look at the slides. I think the video is about like 30 minutes, but the information, the slides, the PowerPoint slides are very helpful to you. So I definitely suggest that you look at the PowerPoint slides to get a sense of how insects play a role in um, death investigations, particularly um, time of death. Then this is also in your textbook, right? We have stomach contents um, and uh, potassium levels within our vitreous humor um, are ways to estimate TOD, which is time of death. TOD is time of death. So we can look at the stomach contents to get a sense of when was your last meal? When was the person's last meal? Um, and then potassium levels in our vitreous humor. Vitreous humor is the substance in our eyeballs, okay? Um, it's a gelatinous substance that gives our eyeballs the appropriate pressure and consistency it needs um, to allow us to view and see the things that we do. And so after death, um, our eyeballs release potassium. So there's gonna be an increase of potassium in our vitreous humor. So they can use a syringe injected into the eyeball during the autopsy, pull some vitreous humor out of the eyeball and test that for the levels of potassium. Um, it proves to be helpful because it's such, such an insulated area of the body that really isn't exposed to any type of infiltration, whether it's insects, it's kind of protected from the weather, from the elements. Um, so that is a viable option for them when it comes to um, estimating uh, TOD. Water submerged bodies, you can star this, that's just for your information, okay? That's just for your information. So you can look at that a little bit later on. Um, asphyxia, let's talk a little bit about asphyxial deaths because you, you will see this. Um, so asphyxial deaths are due to a lack of oxygen, a lack of uptake, utilization of O2, oxygen, okay? And we all know how imperative oxygen is um, uh, for us to function. Um, so um, uh, it can drastically impair someone very quickly and can actually ultimately cause death if the brain is not able to utilize the oxygen it needs. So there are several categories of asphyxia. Let's talk about them. We have compression of the neck. Um, we have obstruction of airway. We have compression of the chest. And we have a gas, gaseous uptake, okay? So let's look at the first one, compression of the neck. So that's any pressure on our neck, okay? Whether it is a ligature, whether it is someone's hands, okay? So we're dealing with hangings, we're dealing with strangulations. And I've also listed on here some of the inflictions that you can see from each. Okay, I have some pictures, so we'll look at some things. Um, but with hangings, you're going to see that there's going to be a lot of lividity above the ligature or whatever apparatus was used for the hanging. Okay, so you're going to see heavy lividity at the bottom of the neck. Um, the face may actually present as a purple color. Um, they're going to have a little bit of petechial hemorrhaging. I'll show you guys what that looks like. The eyes and the tongue may actually protrude out. Um, and with strangulations, right, um, it's very natural, um, especially for hom homicidal, for and even accidental, for and probably even suicidal, for people to grab at the ligature and they're grabbing to save their life. So you're going to see fingertip bruises, some type of hemorrhaging all around the ligature around the neck, okay? So here you can see there's a, a very distinctive difference um, in the color of the face versus the neck, right? We have really heavy lividity. We can see that the tongue is protruding out, okay? 
and there's clearly some other inflictions um, on the body too for us to see that the blood dripping down. And you can see that's very heavy um, lividity um, in the feet. Okay, and we do have a little bit of rigor mortis in that picture as well. These next few pictures come from John Benet Ramsey case. Okay, um, this uh, she's about six or five years old, um, found dead in her parents' um, basement. This was in the '90s. Her 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 death is still unsolved. Um, Although there have been allegations that maybe her parents were responsible, maybe her brother was responsible. Her brother was only about eight or nine at the time, um, but we never have, we haven't yet to solve this case. Um, but here's the strangulation, right? You guys can see, again, I'm sorry that I can't use my mouse. I don't know what's going on. I got to try to fix that. But you can see that there are fingertips right right above the center of the neck, um, above the ligature. Those are fingernail bruises. Then we do have this really large bruise on the left side of the head of the neck. Um, that's a hemorrhage. Okay. You can also see, if you look closely, you can see the imprint of the ligature. We can see that it was in three different positions, right? You can see this lighter imprint towards the bottom of the neck. And then you can look up a little bit higher and you can see that um, there is another faint imprint of a position of the ligature. And then you have the final ligature position, okay? Um, so we can look for those details and strangulations, but you can still see that you know we do have some hemorrhaging and some fingernail bruises as well. Again, we can see our tongue is protruding out. We have a very distinct ligature imprint, the ligature or the rope or whatever um, used during this hanging is not on his neck. It has actually been removed, um, but it's common to see um, this level of imprint into a neck where the, the, the imprint of the ligature is so clear, okay? And it can be helpful for, for evidence, purposes of evidence. We have heavy lividity towards the bottom of the neck um, compared to, excuse me, on the bottom of the head, top of the neck, compared to the bottom of the neck chest, there is a drastic difference in color. Obstruction of airways, that's basically just something that's stuck in your esophagus, or there's a swelling in your esophagus, okay? Maybe due to allergic reaction, maybe you're choking, or someone is smothering you, okay? Um, here, top left picture, those little red dots you see are petechial hemorrhages, okay? And then the other photos are showing you the rib cage where we can see some um, hemorrhaging, right? At the, the top right picture towards the top left side of the rib cage, you can see some black, purple, dark purple, that's all hemorrhaging, that's bruising. And you can um, see that in the other pictures as well, which are just showing you some, some, some hemorrhaging. And I think on the slide talking about indications of death, there's Takanari. Okay. Um, that's, if you look at the top left corner, you see how the eye is a little bit of a grayish black. Even the white parts of the eyes are gray. That's Takanari. Okay. When the eye uh, turns a grayish black color. Okay. Here, showing you a little bit. This is a severe case of um, petechial hemorrhaging. Um, but we also saw it in uh, the previous picture, which is uh, not as drastic. 
Okay. We have gaseous uptake. Okay, so we need uh, uptake of gas that overpowers uptake of oxygen. It could be a lot of different types of gaseous uptakes. Um, but as I noted before, we can sometimes see these, um, that we can sometimes see that lividity proves to be helpful in these types of um, investigations, okay? So this is a hand that has lividity, believe it or not. Um, now for us lay people in this, this area, um, this may just look like a normal hand, right? Maybe, the, maybe this is a hand of a person that's a little cold, maybe. Um, but this has some of the cherry pink lividity um, that is indicative like of a carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, so the lividity can be very faint, but um, these professionals um, are able to observe this, this, this change in color and actually come up with um, a type of poison, um, at least presumptively the poison responsible um, for the death. But of course, um, they're going to, to get some toxicology tests to confirm. Um, then you also have sex associated. Um, I really don't like sex associated because it can fall under any of the other categories, but it's just those types of asphyxial deaths that we see in sex related encounters. Um, but obviously um, they, they, like I said, they can fall under any of the other types of categories. Um, whether it's a hanging or strangulation or smothering, right? Um, okay, um, now we have blunt and force, um, sharp force trauma. Let me just skip ahead really quickly, hold on. Yeah, okay, so we're almost done with this slide here, with these slides and then we'll be done with forensic pathology. So, um, Difference between sharp and blunt force. Sharp is a cut and divide of tissue while blunt is some type of shear or crushing, okay? There are different categories of injuries that can fall under blunt force. All of them we're very familiar with. I know we've all suffered abrasions. Um, we've all had some type of contusion, right? Which is pretty much just a bruise. Um, and maybe some of us have had some lacerations. Okay, um, these are all injuries that happen because of a blunt force trauma, some type of velocity or impact with an object or you know the ground or whatever that causes us to have abrasions, contusions, or lacerations. Okay, so let's look at the injuries. Um, this is a prime example of a blunt force trauma. Okay, um, when you open into the skin and open into someone's body. This is not what you see, right? I know that during videos and movies, they make it seem like, you know, you're gonna see all this blood everywhere. If it's not real life, that's not true. The blood remains in your vessels until they are broken. Usually they can be broken by a sharp um, force or a blunt force. Um, also, you can see that the skull has several fractures in it. That is not normal as well, okay? So we have a lot of internal bleeding here as well as some fractures to the skull. Then um, another type of blood force trauma is commodial cortis, okay? Um, this is the instantaneous cardiac arrest um, due to uh, a blood force trauma to the chest, okay? Um, and, you know, if it is, you know, uh, from someone hitting someone with the bat, or you know, not catching a ball at the right angle or something like that, and it ends up hitting their chest, you can have what they do call instantaneous cardiac arrest or commodial cortis, okay? Interesting thing about commodial cortis, sometimes you'll see the chest presents with no outward injury, okay? You're not going to see a contusion. You may not see a laceration, right? Um, but when you open the body, that's when you can actually start to see some injuries and some impacts. Okay. 
This is another example of um, a blunt force injury. Okay, um, we have some um, lacerations. Okay, in this um, organ. Okay, these are all due to a blunt force trauma. So if you have lacerations to the kidney, you are, this is what you're going to see. Okay, um, so for, you know, some football players that have lacerated kidneys or lacerated livers, this is what their organ looks like. Looks very, very painful. This is an example of internal bleeding, again, due to blunt force trauma. Again, I can't reiterate enough. When you open the body, whether someone's alive or dead, you're not going to have blood. You're not, you shouldn't see blood. Blood should be in the vessels. So when we see this, we know that we're dealing with broken vessels. Um, and this is just an example of what internal bleeding looks like due to um, uh, a blunt force trauma. Okay. And then this, this, is, this is just for information about skeletal injuries um, from high heights. Um, it's just listing for you guys some of the, um, the injuries that we can see, usually mostly broken or fractured bones um, in our legs or tibia or femur, things like that. Um, some um, injuries in our, our feet as well. Anybody have any questions? So um, the rest of the slides onward, you know, after this slide, um, you guys don't need to be responsible for this because we're actually going to cover this in other areas. Um, forensic pathology is a very dense area, and I think that some of this stuff we can cover when we talk about the subspecialties relevant to this area. So for biting injuries, we are gonna talk about that during um, odontology. And the same thing with firearm injuries, we're gonna talk about that when we talk about firearms and ballistics. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Then we can talk about Anthropology, okay. Um, anthropology is also covered in your textbook. There's a couple of things that I want you to know about anthropology. So let's kind of go over it really quickly. And I'll draw your attention to those things that are important. Everyone can see my screen? Yes. Okay. So again, right, for this subspecialty, let's take out forensics and let's just focus on what is anthropology. So you can understand how the science itself is applied to law and to investigations. Um, there are several different types of anthropology. So archeology, span for example, the last bullet point, is a type of anthropology, okay? So that's studying past cultures, you know, um, skeletal remains from hundreds of centuries, like centuries ago, hundreds of years ago, as well as, you know, dinosaurs and different animal um, structural remains. Um, we also have cultural and linguistics, okay? Um, that's a study that deals with how we function um, from a society, from language to language, past and present, 
um, among humans. And then the first one, that's the one that I want you guys to know, physical anthropology. And that's all about skeletal remains. Okay, understanding the biology um, and the skeletal structure of animals, um, primates in particular. Okay, so that's important to know there. Okay, this is just for your information about um, the educational background of anthropologists, but it's just information for you guys. Okay, now this is something to know, but I think you guys probably can pick up on this already, right? When is the anthropologist going to be involved, right? Because we, 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 we work with anthropologists the moment that we're dealing with skeletal remains, right? Um, um, where, you know, if they're dealing with an archaeological excavation, they can do that, but that's not applicable to this class. Um, remains are badly burned or decomposed, okay? That's where we're going to have our anthropologists called in to help us. Or skeletal remains, right? So ultimately, it's just really about being at a point where we cannot identify the body and our pathologist doesn't have enough tissue matter to do the type of medical examinations that they're able to do. They need to recall them to the anthropologist. How can they support the investigation? Okay, they can provide information on age, sex, ancestry. They can look at the height, they can see if there are injuries or traumas, and they can support in identifying a potential cause of death. Okay. So um, for the next few slides, they just go into a little bit more detail of how the anthropologist can figure out age, sex, ancestry, stature, um, um, and injuries. Okay, so this slide is talking about how do they determine age. Um, and uh, the most important structure for them is looking at the pelvis. Okay. Um, and they're also looking at, uh, they can look at the dental structures. Okay. And that's where it says here, they can look at the teeth can re reveal the age of human remains. Okay, so th the teeth and the pelvis are the two bones important for identifying age. Okay, this is just showing you a picture of the changes in the teeth after certain periods of time. Okay. If they have the femur bone, which is the bone in your leg, okay, um, the top bone of your leg, um, they can look for the epiphyseal union, okay? That's really only helpful for young children if um, they do not have teeth or if their teeth are, you know, are missing. Um, when it comes to height, um, they're looking at um, certain bones, including um, spine, tibia, or, or femur. Okay, so our spine and our leg muscles. Um, and they could take our humerus muscle, which is the bone in our arm. Um, and apparently if you times that by five, it gives an approximate height of the person. Okay. So again, for heights, um, we're looking at our spine, if they have the full spine, tibia and femur, bones in our legs, humerus, bone in our arm, the top bone in our arm. Ethnicity, they can look at the skull. Okay. 
and the different features of the skull. So you can see the difference in the picture on the bottom, okay, um, where um, you can see a difference in the size of the orbits. Um, the cheekbones are, are of varying size and the nasal, the size of the nasal cavity is different, right, from one ethnicity to the other. Okay, um, gender, pelvis, okay, pelvis is going to give them all the answers they need to determine um, gender, okay. Um, and then if the skeletal remains present with injuries that can help with the cause of death, um, time of death, they're going to look at those injuries and kind of um, come up with um, not a conclusion, but an assessment, right? So they're going to look at the skeletal remains to see if there's any um, evidence of some type of um, blunt force trauma, like the pictures we looked at, if there's any um, indication of a sharp forge trauma, or if there are any um, evidence of a shooting, ballistics, okay? Um, they're just gonna look at the body in totality and see if there's anything abnormal about the skeletal remains that could help identify cause of death. Okay, okay, and I think, yeah, that's pretty much it for the rest of this is, um, information for you guys. I just really want you guys to focus on knowing how an anthropologist can support the investigation. What are they looking for? Just like with pathologists, we just talked about how a pathologist can help our investigation by identifying the body, they're determining cause and manner of death, they're looking at the injuries, blah, 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 blah. Same thing for an anthropologist. Okay, we didn't go too much into anthropology because I just want to highlight this for you guys. This is kind of like a, a highlight. Forensic pathology was the bigger topic for tonight. So for anthropology, you know, this is just kind of like a spotlight subspecialty um, where you don't need to go into the weeds of it. But I do want you to at least know what is anthropology and how can an anthropologist help an investigation. And that is by pretty much this slide here. They can help determine age, sex, gender, blah, 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 blah. And then the next slides give you some indication of what bones they can look at to help them determine age, sex, ancestry, and things like that. Okay, so this is, this is more of like a spotlight subspecialty for you guys. And I'll try to make that clear um, in the syllabus. Alrighty, so for forensic entomology, um, you uh, have the slides. I, I suggest you look at the slides um, you, uh, and just review them. Um, and you can watch the video. Um, the video is about 30 to 35 minutes. It's optional. I think, I believe um, all the information you need is in the packet, but some of you may need more substance. So that's why you have um, the video to, to supplement um, your understanding of forensic entomology. Um, but I will um, make that also clear in the syllabus so you guys know what to expect. Did I go too fast over anything? Do you guys want me to go over something again? Anybody have questions? So right now what's coming up, it's like our lab, which is this week, this weekend, right? That's coming up. And then it's our test. The, just check Canvas for the due date. I don't typically have assignments that do are due on the weekend. It should be due someday next week. It's probably due Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Right, yeah, okay. Okay. 
Um, Professor, I don't know if you mentioned it, but um, can you tell us how many questions are on the test? Um, I think it's about 40. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I hope I didn't go too fast over anything. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to email me and um, I, you know, try to talk through any questions you may have. Um, again, I won't see you guys. I won't see you guys actually for a couple of weeks unless you come to the office hours. Okay, so next week there is no Zoom class. Use that time to do your test. I think um, you should definitely be able to finish it within four hours <laughs> if you want to sit and just take the test as if you're in, in class um, like we would if we were in person. Or you can just take it over the days that it's open to you. Just please make sure you submit it on time. There are no late submissions. So if you need to set a reminder on your phone, set a reminder right now. Everybody pick up their phone and say, my, you know, your forensic science um, test number one is due. Um, and, and when it's open, okay? Um, because I, I, I won't accept any late submissions. So just please, please, please make sure you submit it on time. And the same for your lab. Your lab should probably take you about what, I think 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, so make sure you do that before the deadline as well. I have a question. Yes. Where can I find the recording of the Zoom uh, meetings? Um, I don't post them um, unless I have to because um, people end up not coming to class um, simply because the class is recorded. Um, and that's been a challenge since, since this started. Um, but if you feel that you need the recording, I can upload it. You're just gonna have to give me a couple of days because it takes forever um, to download it. And then it usually takes me overnight for YouTube to, to upload the video. Um, but do you think that you need it or it'll be helpful to you? Only this class, uh, only like this um, Zoom meeting. Okay. Went through some of the stuff where um I was kind of lost, and then like uh, you said that some of the stuff that we don't have to study for for the test, so I I'm not sure about those. Okay, that's fine. Just give me a few days to um upload it onto YouTube, download it, and then upload it into YouTube because um for whatever it was so much easier when we had the professor, us teachers, um, we can save all the recordings to the cloud. That was so easy, but now we have to, um, for whatever reason, we don't have that license anymore. So we have to actually download it to our computers. Um, and with all the classes I teach, it just takes up so much space on my, my, um, my computer. And then it just, it takes forever to upload it to, um, to, to um, YouTube, but I will, be, you know, I don't have a problem um, putting it on um, Canvas. Just give me a couple of days and I typically post them under studio, but I also just create a line item in modules. It'll say something like recorded class from February 9th. And you should be able to just click to it, click on it and it'll take you straight to the video. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No questions. Okay, well, I'll see you guys um, actually in person and on Zoom in a few weeks. Email me if you have any questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Professor, have a good Thank day. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Be safe, guys. Bye. Be good, everyone. Good night. Bye.